Okay, so uh, this is going to be what we call like hands-on tutorial. So it's going to take us half a day. And I think if you see the outline there, uh, first of all, we're going to introduce uh, what multimodal recommender systems are. And uh, interspersed with the content, we're going to have the hands-on exercises. This is, these are going to be done on like a notebook. We'll tell you the links uh, later. And uh, you, you can actually get access to some of these implementations. You can try it out on your laptop and you can... Uh, give it a try and, and to see how this actually is going to work out. And then we're going to talk about the different ways in which we incorporate modalities like text and images. Uh, Tuan is going to do that. Graph modality, Agilis will then come and tell us about graph modality as well. Uh, there's going to be a coffee break in the middle so that we can refresh ourselves and so on. Then in the second half, uh, we're going to look at some hands-on exercises. Uh, then Huang is going to come in to, to, to talk about explainability. And finally, there's going to be a hands-on part and explainability as well. So that's kind of what to expect uh, within this session. Now, without further ado, uh, let us get started. Now, just in case you're wondering where the slides are, uh, there's going to be a link. Uh, well, I mean, we actually, the, the whole link is actually there, but it's, it's kind of uh, too long. So in some sense, if you do go to Prefet AI, WW23-tutorial, uh, it's kind of like a blog post, and the blog post is going to contain a link to, let me just show up where that link is so that everybody can find it. So it's going to be a blog post like this, and then there is a link for the hands-on materials. So then it's going to take you to a GitHub page, and a GitHub page, there is the first, the first thing is the slides. So just in case you kind of want to look ahead and so on, and then all the notebooks are going to be there as well. All right, so now the idea of why we rely on recommendations to begin with, uh, these are primarily because uh, the amount of choices that we have uh, when we go online, there are just too many possibilities. Uh, we can't possibly query everything. We can't give you like a, such a specific query that is going to be exactly the kind of thing that you're looking for in a particular site. Instead, there are still too many choices and somehow the system needs to figure out what uh, those few choices that are most suitable for the users are. Now, in this case, we give it a try for Amazon. For example, if you find men's shoes on Amazon, there could be 133,000 results, and we can't possibly go through all of them, so then we need recommendations. Now, if you go to Taobao in China, now in this case, 4 million results. So, and these numbers are still growing, and that's kind of a, uh, underlines why we consider that recommended systems are pretty important. Now, the solution then is to find those few items that are going to be most uh, suitable for any particular user. Now, why do we look at multimodality is because uh, the core problem within any recommended system is that uh, there is too little data. Uh, there is too little data both on the part of the users because most of the time, uh, you know, we don't interact that much with any one system. And even if you do, we don't always log in. I mean, maybe when it comes time to buying something, then you log in and then you okay, you tell the system who you are, then they can keep track. But for the rest of the time, you may just be browsing. So in effect, you're actually producing a lot of interactions with the system, but you're not yet identifiable. And therefore, then for the average user, we don't have a lot of data. Now, on the side of the items, uh, now on the products, so I call it items, uh, the sparsity comes in uh, from the fact that uh, there are always new items because this, the universe of the catalog is increasing over time. There are always new videos on YouTube. There are always uh, new news articles, uh, even new products that keep appearing over time. So in that sense, anything new is not going to have a lot of information. So which means that uh, the underlying recommendation systems that are built on top of preference data that rely on interactions, and they're always limited by the sparsity of these interactions. Now, so the, the, the solution then is to go to what we call the modalities, extra modalities, and these extra modalities come in the form of images and text as well as uh, ratings. Now, for any form of uh, recommendation systems, uh, they are generally reduced to either of these problems. Either the problem of rating prediction simply means that we're going to predict a specific value, or we're going to do a ranking. So let me give you, let's say, top 10 products that you're most likely to want to be interested in. Now, as we begin to think about the notion of modalities, uh, we come back to the original paradigm of what recommendations are based on. Now, collaborative filtering is when they are based on the interactions. Means if I like this item because I'm similar in terms of my interactions with the system with another user. 
and, and, and that similarity in the way that we interact with the system uh, become the basis for the recommendation. And that's what we call collaborative goal theory. And they are sparse, sparse in the sense that uh, every average user doesn't have a lot of uh, data. Now, a long, long time ago, people start talking about recommendation systems in the context of content-based filtering. Now, in the content base, meaning that we're going to recommend you an item based on the content. So if you like to read certain kind of books, for example, uh, then based on the content of the book, I can find other similar books to recommend to you. So then when we talk about multimodality, essentially, in, the, in a nutshell, they, they, they are, they are uh, unified models. They try to make use of both of this information. So on the one hand, one modality is what we call the collaborative building modality, the preferences. The other modality essentially is the content. The content can be associated with the product in terms of uh, if you're looking at clothes, then basically they are the photos of uh, the different clothing items. Uh, it can be text. If you're looking at books, then it can be the synopsis of the book and so on. It can also be graph in a sense that a lot of information surrounding a particular item can be formulated as graph because it connects them to a lot of other information. Now, uh, matrix categorization has always been a big part of recommendation systems, uh, you know, starting from the Netflix era. Uh, but in some sense, uh, matrix categorization, the core concept simply is that uh, we formulate the interaction data in terms of a matrix. So you have users on one hand, you have items on the other hand, and then the cell and the matrix will be the basic interactions. Now, they are sparse. And so in order to complete the matrix, we're going to factorize it. So these are essentially linear algebra types of information, at least it used to be. Now, in that case, then we factorize them into latent factors. And when we multiply them back together, we get the original matrix, or at least a more complete a version of the original matrix. And so then we are filling in the missing values with predictions. Now, matrix factorization is one scheme of doing this. And let's say if you were to kind of already formulate it in terms of the loss function that we're trying to optimize, the R essentially is the ratings data, the U and the V, U is the user vectors, V is item vectors. And then we are basically looking for U and V that when we've multiplied them together, we're gonna to get back the original R as closely as possible. Now, the reason why we kind of go through a little bit of this basic because it turns out that when we talk about multimodal recommendations later, you're essentially building the extra modality on top of some fundamental uh, method for recommendations. And of course, there is also the idea of regularization because uh, a lot of these problems are uh, not going to be solvable in closed form. So in that case, even when you optimize them, uh, we probably want constraints and the latent factors that we learn so that we don't overfit the data, which is very sparse to begin with. Uh, there's also the concept of biases, and this item and user biases, it, it basically encapsulates the idea that some items are just so popular. So no matter who is going to uh, select, they, they, they tend to pick the most popular item. So therefore, then it might not incorporate personalized preference, but more of just the underlying bias of the system towards certain items. In the same way, some users, if you look at ratings, uh, they tend to assign high ratings to anything and everything. So oh, they only rate when they rate when it's a five, right? So they don't actually do rating one, two, three. In that case, then we also consider such a user bias. It might not necessarily that uh, he is likes everything, but maybe he only comes to the system to give only good ratings. Otherwise, he doesn't. Uh, there is also the question of whether it's explicit versus implicit feedback. And when we talk about explicit, they are usually exact ratings kind of thing, like very explicit. It's very clear. It's rating of five out of five. It must be good. Uh, it's rating of one out of five. Then it must be that it's a negative thing. Now, implicit is a lot noisier. Uh, this could be, for example, like clicks. So when you click and browse certain things and so on, we collect a lot of data from that. But uh, just because you're clicking doesn't mean that you like an item. It could be that you're just exploring. It could be that you click because of an ad that shows up uh, and you just try to close something. So it's noisy. Uh, so in that case, it's not as highly quality as explicit data. But on the other hand, it is uh, numerous because uh, implicit means like uh, you, it's basically based on noisy information, but there is a, an abundance of them. So then you still get a lot of signal from that. So just to get your sense that uh, when we talk about, uh, let's say, building implicit feedback, we, we factor, factor it into like matrix factorization as well. Uh, in this particular case, this is one of the classical uh, way to deal with implicit data, which is called weighted matrix factorization, 
where in this case, the implicit thing comes from the way that we, we, we incorporate like a confidence uh, factor. Uh, Bayesian personalized ranking, I think a lot of you probably are familiar with this as well, is the whole idea that uh, we're going to fit the rankings, not the ratings. So for example, if you rate an item five, the other one a three, uh, maybe it's not as important that I get exact rating five and three. Maybe it's more important that I rank the higher rating higher than the lower rating. Because maybe in overall, your intention is not so much to assign a specific value as it is to essentially be ranking different items. Now, from matrix factorization, I think the literature has kind of moved a little bit towards the neural models as well. I think if you look at some of the uh, popular neural methods for recommendations, one of them is what is called neural cognitive filtering, uh, which becomes a, a generalized form of matrix factorization in the sense that you can now go to non-linear space. Because now with neural networks, you can do a little bit more of the fancier things. It's not just a linear operation anymore but you can add in multiple layers, you can add in different kind of activation. And so that becomes um, uh, 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 some of the more modern ways of doing matrix factorization. There's also the basic uh, model of very auto encoders, because in some sense uh, we are, when we say user vectors, other vectors, we are essentially learning a representation for each user uh, that allows us to uh, uh, decode it in some sense, like we encode every user into a particular representation. And we decode that into what kind of items the user would actually like. So in, in the case of using VAE, for instance, then we might start out, let's say, with a vector of, of uh, the dimensions of the, is the catalog, like the whole items. And then we just look at which items has been rated high or low. And then it gets encoded to some user representation. And the fact that we do VAE, in some senses, uh, we are factorizing the uncertainty of this uh, user uh, representation. And then from there, we decode it back into the original space of which items they might like. So you can think of it as a modern way of doing matrix factorization. It's, it's, uh, in some sense, um, it's, uh, it's useful in that way. And, and, and later on, we actually extended VAE uh, in, in, uh, in the three of us, essentially. Yeah. We, we published that in Wisdom, where uh, in, in the original VAE, essentially, you get a one-sided view. You are trying to derive the user representation. Uh, but then you don't get this item sense of the representation. So in the bilateral VAE, uh, we make them a bit more symmetric in the sense that every user has a representation in the VAE sense, and so is the items. Now, so when we talk about the mod multimodality, just to give you a concrete sense, like what are these multimodal stuff? I mean, just go to any e-commerce site, then you have these uh, product descriptions, these are text. So then uh, product image, these are images like visual. And then you have got all these things like the related products. And this could actually come from the way that users have been browsing and clicking and so on, so that they become extra information. Now, now you have this additional information about the product. How do we make use of them uh, in terms of uh, recommendation? And I think here, uh, some of the cool things that I think, uh, I mean, some, some of the key concepts that we would like you to take away. I think one of course is the idea that uh, this addresses the sparsity problem because now we have additional information. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we this also becomes uh, avenues for explanation because now we can explain recommendation using some of these languages, either in the text or visual or related products. And and one of the observations that we make, and I think that uh, as you as we go through the different uh, methodologies, you're gonna get to see. Uh, is that uh, although in the literature, a lot of the recommendation algorithms, when they propose um, an extra modality, they will say that we are targeting text. And then they will uh, design a model that works with text. Or they will say, this is a visual recommendation, and therefore I'm going to design the visual component. And what we observe through our study of different multimodal recommendation is that there is actually a lot of compatibility between these different modalities to the extent that a paper that uh, uh, purportedly uh, tries to do something with text could actually be used with images. And, and we did some work where we compared some of these things. And it turns out that sometimes uh, if you have text data, it doesn't necessarily mean that you should use a text model. Sometimes you actually may use a, a visual model or a graph model, and eventually you might get some better results. And we kind of uh, think of that not just in terms of multi-modality, but cross-modality. And I think that's another point that's going to come across as well uh, in this later on in the, in the tutorial. Um, 
All right, so I think we touched on this before. I think the idea that multimodality essentially is a, is a marriage between the color filtering and the content-based filtering. Now, um, to, to kind of get you started, like even in this sense of uh, how, how does it all gonna come together? I think I'm gonna invite Agilis to kind of cover uh, the first sense on, it's a short one, but it's gonna give you a sense of what Cognect uh, is about. Uh, thanks, Hadi, for this great introduction. So a few words on Cornac. Uh, so Cornac is um, a Python framework uh, for recommendation. It's open source, uh, developed by uh, Prof's heavy research group uh, called Prefer.ai. And it has also an attached publication in the Journal of Machine Learning Research, uh, where you can get a better sense of the philosophy behind this framework if you are interested. So here's the big picture of Cornac. Uh, there are six main modules. And so the most important one are, of course, uh, data. You have models as well. Uh, so there are over 40 models uh, yeah, as of now implemented there that are, that are directly accessible for experimentation. You have what we call evaluation methods. So those are all the methods that will allow you to split your data and prepare them for experimentation. And then you have the Cornac metrics. So there are different types of metrics here, again, to measure the performance of your recommender systems. And finally, we have uh, this model that we call experiment that will actually consume information from all the different modules and then run the experiment for you on the data you provide, comparing the model you have specified using the evaluation method of your choice and the metric uh, you use to measure the performance. Um, so the key features are uh, modality support. Um, so compared to uh, other framework for recommendation, uh, Coronac has a special focus on making it convenient to work with multimodal recommender systems. Uh, the one uh, that Hedy just uh, introduced before, uh, so then you have a lot of routines that allow you to quickly read, transform, format, and represent those different modalities in a very convenient way, and also allows you to broaden the use case of uh, some existing models. So Hadi just mentioned about the fact that some models, even though they may be originally designed to work with images, with small changes, they can also accommodate other types of modalities. So Cornac also includes uh, different uh, utilities to make this cross-modality utilization uh, quite convenient and easy. Another one is uh, scalability. Um, so there are a collection of iterators there for easy optimization, especially if you are uh, working with um, a ranking kind of objectives like Bayesian personalized ranking. Uh, we are also harnessing all the he Python ecosystem like NumPy, SciPy uh, to have uh, efficient operations as much as possible. And more importantly, some of the methods are directly Im implemented in C++ or Cython uh, to have uh, very efficient um, uh, algorithms. And more importantly is accessibility and reproducibility. So as of now, you have uh, access to more than 40 models uh, on Cornac, which are implemented in a standard way, uh, making it fair when you would like to compare these models. Uh, you have also, we have also made it easy to use a number of benchmark data sets that are commonly considered to uh, fit recommender systems and compare them. And more importantly, give a full control to the user or um, to control the random uh, uh, random uh, random uh, number generation. Um, importantly, like either at the data splitting level, at the optimization model when you shuffle your data, or at initializing your recommender models, you have full control uh, over the random number generations at different at these different stages, which allows you to reproduce. Uh, experiment with uh, some level uh, of precision. Um, and then just um, uh, to finish on this, it's really like designed to reflect the different step we take uh, when we run experiments. 
Um, that's probably true for um, most of machine learning problems, but here uh, the focus is on a recommender system. So you have data loading first, evaluation method, you choose the models you want to compare, you choose the metrics you want to use to measure performance, and then you run the experiment. So it's try to make it as intuitive as possible. Um, so and now I invite you to visit the link, uh, which was uh, shared earlier here for the hands-on Cornet. So basically, if we go to this link, let me do that live. Oh, sorry, uh, I may need, oh, it's already. It should be in this one, getting started, yeah. Perfect, thanks. Um, so the first thing to do is uh, to install Cornac. Uh, so simply like use uh, uh, PIP should be fine. And then uh, we have uh, this thing that we call the first experiment that consists in uh, loading some data sets that are already accessible through Cornac. Uh, this is the MovieLens 100K data set. And once you have completed the data set here, we specify three models uh, that we can fit and compare uh, by choosing the different parameters as well. Uh, so you choose your list of models, you choose the list of metrics, put everything to an experiment, and then just run this experiment. So if everything goes well, you should be able to recover uh, the table over here which will give you the performance per method, per metric, as well as uh, the time it took for training and inference. And then here we have a couple of questions, uh, which are just about what you can infer from these results. And also if you want to um, uh, give it uh, more try, consider using other models such as weighted matrix factorization, um, and, and compare it with BPR uh, on the same data set using the metrics AUC, recall, and, uh, and the CG at 50. So yeah, it takes some time to go through it and don't hesitate to uh, uh, let us know if you need any help or if the installation doesn't go well for you, um, please feel free to let us know. Okay, thank you. So uh, are there people who are already able to install Cornac and, and run this example? Is, is it working or? Still loading. Oh, it's still loading? <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah, so it's actually like for all the tutorial, like for all the hands-on part, we have it listed here in the same GitHub repo. Uh, the very first one that we just show now is actually here, the getting started. Uh, if you open that, it should show link on GitHub, but there's this button here like run on Google Colab. I think it's going to lead you to Google Colab, which is a free platform for you to uh, run the notebook environment. Yeah, so, so if you click on this, it's going to show uh, what we have here and then yeah, I guess it's pretty cool to, to run it on Google Colab. And then you can uh, just uh, click to the runtime and then basically run all. If uh, something happened, then we're going to know. Otherwise, if it's expected, then it should show the table, which indicate that the experiment goes well. And then uh, we can actually uh, change the other models. Yeah, just to show it's the connect library actually we um you want to talk a little bit about the connect uh, as well like we have other things on github to to show them case yeah uh absolutely thanks to one um so um on the 
GitHub uh, repo, actually, you have a lot more things. Uh, so if you are, for example, looking for uh, more advanced uh, ways to use the Cornac for multimodal recommender systems, we have a set of tutorials. Um, we have a lot of examples as well, um, uh, pretty much for every model to run it on a specific data set. And the list of models is also available, so you can check it out. And then we have the data sets as well, the list of data sets. Uh, and of course, uh, there is a linked documentation to it. So as you can check, like maybe the different parameters of every model, uh, what they mean and what do they correspond to. Uh, so let's just go to the GitHub repo. So again, everything is here, documentation, tutorials, um, explains you how to install the model, how to run hyperparameter search, uh, for example, using uh, um a uh, greedy or random search and yeah and you have also like um a bunch of uh, tutorials which are focused on multimodality and also uh, specifically how to uh, perform this notion of uh, cross modality like suppose that you have a model that was designed to work with images but it so happened that your data doesn't have images but comes with another type of data let's say graph, for example, then uh, can you leverage that if you don't want to change the model, like make your original model or original architecture work with a different modality? So those are um, useful resources. Uh, uh, if you want to uh, uh, get more familiar with the framework, uh, then if we come back here, so I mentioned that there is a list of models. Uh, so it's here in this page. Uh, usually you have the name uh, of the model or the paper uh, which um, proposes the model. Uh, so you will have directly a direct link to the paper usually, and then the requirements. Um, uh, it, one important thing to know about requirement is that Cornac itself does not depend on any other framework. Uh, it's um, what I mean. Um, it's not dependent, for example, on uh, Torch, TensorFlow, or any deep learning framework. But when you implement a model, you are free to use any framework that you want. Uh, the only thing is that you will have to specify the requirement uh, in a corresponding file. So if we take the example of uh, BVAE here, then we'll see that the requirement is to have Torch because the model has been implemented uh, using Torch. So this, uh, of course, gives more flexibility to the user uh, on what framework, what machine learning framework they use to implement their models. Uh, and most of the time, you have also a corresponding example that shows you how to run this model on a given data set. So you quickly get a sense of what type of data you need to run uh, these models. Mm. And then also more importantly, uh, in the tutorial part, uh, you also explain how to make your model available in Cornac. Let's say you have a new model, which is not in Cornac. It should not take more than 10 minutes to wrap it up and make it available in Cornac. So as you can compare it to all the models uh, already available in Cornac. Um, So it's here, adding a new recommender model or adding an evaluation metric. Um, it's super easy to do and gives you a standard way to compare with other models. Yeah. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free. Uh, I don't know if some of you were able to run the first experiment yet. Maybe Google Colab can be a better option just in case. Oh, 
Can you just like change the word a little, like point one, please? Yeah. 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 this morning is still running, and then uh, I guess you just run just now, is it? Or? Yeah, yeah, and then. Uh, yeah. Not sure if it's the internet or something, but uh, the latest version is actually 1.15.1, uh, which, but we tested with 1.15.0 as well. It's working, but <laughs> I don't know what is an internet problem or something. Uh, anyway, I think uh, you can have go around with this yeah. thing, and then I think yeah. we just continue with what we have in the tutorial, and then yeah, going back to this uh, later. Uh, okay, perfect. All right, so, so I guess we have an overview of the tutorial and then uh, we get to know uh, Connect and so on. Uh, now I think we go to the um, one of the core components of the tutorial today. So we're gonna talk about three kinds of modalities, the text modality, the image modality, and the graph modality. So I will cover the first two one, the, the text and the images. Um, so uh, text is kind of, um, highly available, uh, as we can see, like it's appear in uh, description of items and so on. And then uh, it's usually is uh, most available. So we categorize the algorithms in, in, in this table. Uh, there are, it's not an exhaustive list of all the algorithms that we have in the recommendation domain, but <laughs> just to give a few uh, representative uh, candidates there, and then it's categorized by um, the core component that being used uh, for the preference learning. Uh, we talk a lot about uh, metric factorization because it's extensible and uh, it's so scalable and a lot of algorithms actually based on uh, metric factorization and extended. Um, the key component where we use to represent the text, uh, starting with like uh, basic like term vectors and so on, like bag of words and so on. And then um, we move on to uh, more advanced uh, things like topic models and autoencoders and then other deep learning uh, models like CNN, INN, LSTM, and so on. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, these uh, kind of methods uh, throughout this tutorial. A few references uh, listed here in this page. And then, um, so we can actually start with this uh, model like SVM, uh, SPD feature. So basically recommendation um, start to get a lot of attention like in the early 2000 and so on. And then um, people start working with this uh, preference data first, and then later on they realize that it's a sparse, right? And then we need to uh, add more information and so on. Um, so in like around like 28, 2010, and then uh, a lot of works actually start looking at the other um, information that we can collect for items. Here in this case, like we have uh, item tags and so on, and then some keywords related to the items. And then the formulation here is that we, uh, already based on metric factorization, and then we, we try to have another a set of factor. In addition to item factor, we're gonna have another set of factor to represent the other key components of the items, like the tag and so on. So each one of them has the, the, the additional uh, uh, latent factor factor. Hey, um, Don, uh, could you please uh, put uh, to the slide mode instead of the presentation oh. mode? Slide mode, which is uh, should we do something here? Slides, slides, slides. Okay, okay. All right, cool. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so um, right, we use the same notation that we actually uh, described previously for metric factorization, and then we have the um key data here is the rating, right? The metrics R, which is rating. Um, and then uh, here in this case we have the additional metrics. Uh, here we uh, take one particular example, which is the matrix D, the item word matrix. So each item could be represented by the, the, the word vectors. It could be a bag of words, DF, IDF, or something like that. And uh, the formulation is that um, in addition to like, estimating the ratings between the uh, user and the item vectors, uh, we have used these item vectors for another factorization uh, component here, which is the um, item word matrix. And uh, the idea is that we're going to borrow some information from the item word matrix, and then um, this uh, item 
latent representation gonna uh, learn some information from there uh, from from the word information and then um basically is jolly learn and then it's gonna try to express the um, user preference better and then predict the rating uh, more correctly uh the other part is just the recognition of the uh, the factors that we already discussed earlier so so those are like the basic formulation where they actually try to extend the metric factorization to work with other kind of additional um, information um it's, it's it's kind of symmetric you can actually explain um express the same problem uh, if we have additional data from user side uh, and so on um so uh the next thing that we want to uh, mention about is the about topic model topic model is actually kind of historic, historical component um period in machine learning as well like now we have like a large language model and so on but uh, earlier on like we have topic models and it start to to work with text data and and um, we can actually model like different latent topics inside the uh, text corpus and so on so people start trying to borrow the idea of topic model into a recommendation and then try to explain text of the uh the the uh, items that we have for example so um this give rise to this particular model called collaborative topic regression um ctr for short um so this is um to describe the model in a nutshell uh, it's a graphical model the uh of the, the ctr model that we have here so it's still based on a metric factorization and you can see here the uh, prediction of the preference so all you can think of the measures of rating for example it's still it's still metric factorization basically the um the vector of user i and the vector of, um uh, item j the vector b here uh, but the thing is that we try to uh, use topic model in order to um, learn this uh, vector B better. Um, so how can we make it better? Uh, so this is the generative process of the graphical model that we just showed earlier. Um, a, little, a little bit too much of detail, but um, for, for each item, basically now is already uh, represented by a document. So we can think of them um, in, in, in this experiment, actually, they use the uh, scientific article and so on, but we can think of the, like a news recommendation and so on. So each item is actually have a, a document and then it's follow the same generative process of the um, like a topic model for each item. And then for the, um, uh, we, we also need to draw the, the user a latent vector and then we uh, try to predict the preference or here we do the adoption uh, in this formulation. So um, the it's better to take a look at this um this uh, loss function basically the objective that we're trying to um to to uh, to learn here so um the very first component here is also the metric factorization as i already mentioned um the thing is that the second component here is the log likelihood of the uh, topic model so basically we try to um learn the representation uh for each of the uh item or basically the document basically to, to maximize the likelihood of the, the corporate, the text corporate that we have. But the last component here is also important when they try to force the item vector to be close with the latent topic of that document inside the corpus that we have. So um, in other words, the they they say that the um, each of the item actually being anchored to some of the uh, important latent topic inside the text corpus that we have and then it could influence how the user actually prefer the item uh, where they try to predict the, uh, the preference or the rating and then in the end uh, it gives some interpretability uh, manner uh, for for the prediction here that we have so that's that the key idea of the uh, using topic model for for um, recommendation so um yeah so it's actually show um the better quality for in matrix, so basically this is like the known items that we already have in the training data. So it's, it's kind of like pretty better than uh, just a collaborative filtering or metric factorization only. Uh, but it also uh, provides us a nice uh, feature that we can actually make prediction for out of matrix. It's like a cold start problem in our recommendation. So the new item comes and we have not got any interaction of the user to the uh, those items but if we have some text information of that item then we can actually make prediction using this framework uh, so that is a nice thing to have um so i've been discussing a lot with the uh, topic model um but you can actually notice the pattern that's going on um uh, in the past uh, uh decade where 
um, they actually try to um, make use of a different uh, deep learning technique uh, to model the text data in order to um, learn a better item representation or user representation, representation uh, and incorporate it with the uh, metric factorization framework. Um, here we start talking about um, an architecture called stack denoising auto encoder. So as the name suggests, it's an auto encoder, but um, the task is that they try to corrupt the um, the the uh, input signal and then um, basically try to uh, ask the model to actually um, add the code into the clean version of the input. So in order to denoise uh, the the noisy part, that we try to uh, put in here the input. Uh, so this idea um, gives rise to this model called collaborative deep learning. Um, so in the autoencoder, usually we try to learn the compact representation, right? Of the in this case, uh, um, the word vector of the uh, item, for example. And, and this compact representation, um, um, are generally to the CDR model previously, is actually the hidden topic. Uh, so in this case, this um, hidden rep has representation of the autoencoder uh, can serve to uh, learn better uh, item vector for, for the our original metric factorization uh, formulation. And uh, as you can see, uh, the very similar um, loss function that we have here is actually um, the um, prediction of the uh, preference or rating. Um, the one that we have, so the, the likelihood that we try to maximize in the topic model now becomes the loss function that makes sure that the autoencoder can actually reconstruct the uh, similar input uh, into the clean output, uh, basically this component. And then um, uh, similarly, we try to force the representation learned by the autoencoder to be close to the uh, item latent fa uh, factor, so then we can actually uh, use that text to, um, to explain our prediction and then actually improve the accuracy and prediction uh, at the same time. So that is the, the, the CTR model and um, experiment actually show that um, um, using this architecture of the autoencoder, um, probably uh, we can actually learn from larger data set and, and also like give a better accuracy, uh, better prediction than, than the CTR model and some other previous uh, model that we have uh, described. Um, so um, this reduction actually uh, keep uh, moving and, and other uh, new architecture actually be introduced and one of the um, Notable uh, model is actually uh, VAE, variational autoencoder, uh, shown to, to be um, more expressive than the um, user autoencoder that we have. Uh, basically, um, it's not only learning like deterministic latent representation, but it's trying to capture the whole distribution of the latent uh, representation. And um, uh, some other um, authors and trying to explore uh, using this architecture um, with the same framework that we have described. And um, as a result, like using um, the VAE, uh, one of the model named the CBAE, um, bringing this idea in and then it's compared with the previous model like CDL as we explained and then CTI and so on. And then um, with the um, CBAE, uh, it's actually give a better quality of recommendation uh, with some experiments that we can see uh, here. Um, and there's this paper that was mentioning um, is also based on VAE. And uh, in this paper, uh, it's, it's slightly different from what all the other paper that we described that actually uh, rely on metric factorization. Here, they rely on uh, VAE components. So on, on the left-hand side, uh, you can actually imagine this uh, VAE for the um, user uh, binary rating vector. Uh, uh, but on, on the right-hand side is the user DFIDF word vector. So it's the two uh, VAE combined together and then um, the author imposes a certain constraint uh, uh, to align the representation of these two VAE in the latent space. And it actually gives um, some uh, disentangled property to the user representation. So um, you can actually check it out and some uh, of the result here that show that uh, you can actually um, modify the representation to actually give it to uh, some explainability to, to the uh, word that being represent, uh, generated from that representation. Um, so beside the uh, VAE, uh, you can think of like other uh, deep learning architecture can be used for text like convolutional uh, neural nets or RNN. There are certain papers that actually 
also making use of this architecture to, to make a better prediction. And uh, one of these papers actually explore CNN and it's actually give a better uh, rating prediction as compared to um, some uh, the model that I have described uh, earlier. Um, so those are the um, overview about the text modality that we developed over time in recommendation. And um, inside uh, Connect, we have a lot of implementation of the text-based model that you can actually explore with. And later on in the um, hands-on, we actually um, run some experiment with some of the models that we have listed here. Uh, but also there are, there are four other models that we can actually explore later on. Um, so we, uh, before we actually moving on to the next modality, which is the image, um, we have any uh, questions or any uh, thing that related to the text modality that we want to discuss before we move on? Yeah. So the uh, couple of slides back, you showed that one of the inputs to this last EAD model variant was a CFIDF word vector. But how did you get a, like, what words are even related to the this? Oh, I, okay. Um, so I guess, okay, actually one of the authors is here, but um, I, I believe that this is like the combination of the, um, so in the training data, you probably have the uh, items, right? Collection of items that user interacted with. And then I, I believe that the author has really gathered all the text that appear for those items. And then that's for the uh, user, the yeah, idea of word vector in, in this case. Yeah. So this is, uh, reconstruction it's still, uh, it's still item text, but uh, they focus on like this is then called user representation. So that's why they kind of um, try to formulate as the um, user side input uh, with the learner representation. Yeah, cool. Thanks. So those are about like a text modality, and um, we can uh, um, switch here and then talk about the image modality. Um, so we also do the same uh, classification here. So basically, for, for image morality, um, it has a lot a less attention than the text because text is always like dead, and a lot of data sets actually uh, have text available. For images, it's a bit um, uh, difficult to get uh, uh, sometimes, and then um, but there, there are certain work that focus on this area, and then I, I list a few key references here that you can actually take a look. Um, so we're going to talk about a few models that have uh, been um, mentioned by a lot in this direction. Uh, one of the models is actually called Visual BPR. So as the name suggests, um, this actually based on the uh, BPR, um, basically it is the personal ranking um, uh, method for recommendation. And it's tried to incorporate the visual feature into this um, framework. Uh, so uh, as, a, as a call, it's, it's still based on metric factorization, right? And you can see actually the rating is still estimated by the user and item factor. And um, in this case, uh, each of the item um, in the experiment is actually focusing on um, Amazon data set. And then uh, for, for fashion, for example, then each of the item we have the, uh, the images and then they use it between uh, CNN to extract the visual feature. Uh, but it's still in the high dimensional, so they learn another uh, projection to project that feature into a lower dimensional uh, where they can actually um, uh, in, uh, fit into this uh, metric factorization uh, framework. And um, if you take a look at this prediction, is uh, something that I just mentioned. Uh, so uh, this is a bias of the, uh, the, the uh, item, and then uh, this is the component where the user vector and other vector interact with each other. And then uh, here is actually the F, FJ here is the, uh, the visual feature that I just mentioned, uh, extracted from CNN for each of the item. And then uh, they learn this uh, projection matrix E, e there to project it into down to the same, uh, uh, same dimension as the uh, matrix factorization uh, uh, vector that we have. Uh, the, uh, the row I there is the uh, also another set of user uh, vector to interact with the visual feature. So basically, uh, two things, right? The user have the vector that interact with the item um, like freely, and then there's this uh, so-called uh, uh, preference of the user in terms of visual uh, that's expressed through this row I, and then that's the interaction between the user and the visual feature of the item, and so on. And uh, the rest are the um, uh, regularization part. Uh, 
So um, the, learning, the learning is um, uh, very much uh, similar. Uh, the, the only difference is that uh, we have talked about EPR, and then um, in, the, in this case, like this, um, uh, minimize the, the log likelihood, but uh, formulate in terms of ranking where uh, given a positive uh, item J and a negative item L, they, they can try to make sure that the uh, the rate of prediction for between item uh, user I and item J actually larger than uh, user I to the item L. So uh, in other words, to tell that the user I actually prefer item J more than item L, uh, this objective. And um, this learning actually uh, give us the train um, vector for the user and item under this framework. And uh, in this paper, they actually compare with a lot of other uh, uh, models. So basically, they are all um, based on metric factorization, but not only the um, pure metric factorization, but also a like BPR, which is the learning, uh, learning to improve rank uh, method. And um, it's actually show the improvement of the uh, recommendation accuracy of in, in this case actually the ranking AUC is a ranking metric and um, it's actually show that uh, adding visual feature in actually improve this uh, ranking metric. Um, there are certain like, interpretation where they try to uh, do clustering and then um, uh, try to, to project it down to uh, lower national two D and try to visualize it, and then they see a certain um, uh, clustering properties of the uh, the visual feature, uh, which makes sense because um, is uh, to express the uh, basically the preference of the, the user to the certain uh, visual uh, visual items, like uh, um, certain user going to prefer this this kind of items like for men, and the other other going to prefer for women, and so on. And then this is the nice effect if we visualize, try to visualize the uh, the, the, um, the the item feature. Um, so um, that that's the early work that try to um, use the between CNN. So so it just like the visual feature extracted from, from between a CNN and that you try to portray to um, lower dimension. Um, in this uh, deep uh, uh, VBPR which is they not only taking the retrain feature, but they trying to train the whole CNN. Uh, so the input for the item now is, is not the visual feature anymore, but it's, it's the whole image. And then they try to train the, the, the whole thing. And um, it's actually um, give a better performance uh, than uh, using only the visual feature, I guess, because uh, later, later on, we actually have more compute and so on to actually train, train the bigger model. So they uh, move towards that direction. And um, this is, uh, this is another model on VMF. Uh, VMF is 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 the symmetric to VPR. Where here um, in in this particular uh, paper, they um, they actually uh, have the uh, visual feature from the user side, and then um, we can actually uh, see that um, the formulation and prediction problem is similar. It's just that it's flip side uh, between the user and item. So just to give this as a reference. Um, so, so besides all this uh, kind of model that um, like uh, visual feature and then try to incorporate into directly into this metric factorization framework, um, there, there are certain other um, paper that actually try to uh, make use of the uh, visual component. Uh, some of them actually um, take into account the um, the image, but um, in, in a way, you can actually think like the video is a, a bunch of images like uh, together. And uh, this uh, ACF is actually um, try to recommend the uh, video, uh, but it's under the same uh, kind of formulation. Um, and another work that I note to mention is that they uh, they actually uh, try to improve recommendation, but through like multi-task uh, view, where they not only do um, this. Uh, uh, preference prediction, but also uh, try to do uh, category prediction for the image. Uh, so basically, um, try to learn a better um, representation of the item through multi-task learning. And uh, also, um, uh, there are there are certain paper take a look at this uh, this disentangle um, properties of the representation that can learn from uh, from from uh, from visual. Uh, in this case, they they try both. They they have the text textual feature and then the visual feature as well. Um, 
in this problem. I just uh, mentioned that uh, for, for reference. Um, so all this all this work uh, in academia actually um, focus heavily on 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 matrix factorization framework, but in industry, uh, particularly in this paper actually uh, from printers, and they actually um, use visual feature, but not directly into um, this matrix factorization framework. But they use an additional feature to the node. And then that node is a in certain graph and um, use the item uh, graph. Item here in the picture is actually an image, right? Pin and so on. And uh, they the, the end model is actually um, a graph convolutional model, but like visual actually contribute to the uh, learning uh, to improve the quality of the uh, the node embedding. And it's actually important because uh, for for pictures like a lot of data actually images, so so visual feature is actually a critical component here. And um, for doing recommendation, they uh, after they learn the model, then uh, each of the node have embedding and they do a nearest neighbor lookup for for recommendation. Um, and actually, in Connect, we have uh, quite a few model, a uh, visual model that you can actually explore with, and then uh, we're gonna introduce a few of them later on uh, in the hands-on section. Um, yeah, I think with that, I, I can actually pass it over to Angelis, uh, who gonna talk more about graph modality. Thanks, Juan. Um, so uh, we'll move now to the graph modality. So um, first, let's set a little bit of context and see what it means in the cost, uh, in in the case of recommendation models. So first of all, we can have this information either on the user side. So this will often be some sort of social network, and the connection can be either indirected or uh, directed. And often we represent this graph with uh, some sort of HSC matrix. Um, so why is this social graph important? Is because there are several studies that have showed that actually users tend to be biased by the preference of their friends and their environment. Uh, the assumption here is that there could be two signals uh, driving the user preferences. Uh, one is the collaborative or user item interactions, and the other one is the social connection of this user. And the goal of what we refer to as social collaborative filtering is to capture those two signals. And in the example here uh, is just a simple illustration um, which shows a user uh, which expressed her preferences as well as the preference of her friends and then uh, the set of recommendations she receives on the bottom, some of which seem to come more from her social interactions and some that came more from her personal preferences. We can also have graphs from the item side. And often in this case, we are interested in some sort of item relatedness. Um, where does this information, where can we find this kind of information? It can be a knowledge graph, for example, a knowledge graph of items. In this example, we have movies, and then we have connections between our movies and different types of entities, um, uh, like actors, director, etc. Or it can be browsing data. Uh, in this example, uh, we see an item and a set of other items that are often co-browsed, sometimes even co-purchased uh, with that item. So this type of data can also be represented as a graph of item. Uh, now, why is item relatedness important? The reason is we tend to consume items uh, that often can complement each other, uh, such as a pair, um, uh, such as, for example, uh, a shirt and a pair of shoes. Uh, we also sometimes consume items that can be alternatives to each other, like two shirts of different colors, like in the example here, a black shirt and a blue one. And the item relatedness here can go beyond feature similarity. So if you take, for example, the shirts here and the shoes, they would have very different features, uh, but they are related in the sense that they can complement each other. And this notion is super hard to capture with the text or image modality, because obviously a shirt doesn't look like um, a pair of shoes. And also the textual descriptions of both items are uh, very different. 
All right, so uh, for this graph modality, we will take a slightly different approach than for text and image. Uh, so we will try rather to focus on what are the main families to integrate uh, this graph modality into uh, recommender models. Uh, and we will take a model-centric approach, uh, which means like we will classify this methods based on the modeling uh, uh, aspect of it and not a data-centric approach, which is also just as interesting. So the first family that we will visit, uh, and we will give examples for every family, uh, is what we call in this tutorial the feature-based approach. So the idea here is that we have two types of observations, user-item interactions and a user-user graph or item-item graph or even both. And the goal is to drive user or item representations from both signals. Uh, and existing methods in this family, they would usually differ on what types of models they use to represent the user item interactions and the graph information. The other family is regularization based. Uh, we'll see that the goal of this family is to find a way to add, to regularize your um, model uh, by using uh, the graph. And the goal in the, in the end is to have actually connected objects have to have similar representation, to encourage connected objects to have similar representations in the latent space. And the last one is what we call graph aware architecture. So this time the architecture of your preference model will be affected by the graph itself. And the learning will be driven by one signal only, which is the um, collaborative signal. So some of the methods that we will present here may not be the latest one, but the most important here is to get uh, the pattern uh, behind these different methods. And in principle, if you are able to cover these families, you will be um, capable of understanding uh, the other types of methods. Uh, so there are a lot of models trying to integrate graph data into recommender systems. The goal here is just like to identify the common patterns between all these methods. So for the first one, a feature-based approach. Uh, so here we have an example uh, where our data, our graph data is a user social network. So the common pattern to this type of methods is, let's say, to drive a user representation by the collaborative featuring data and the social network simultaneously. Uh, so it gives us a big picture. So here we are treating the user case, but because the nature of uh, preference data is two-way, anything you can do, sorry, on the item side, you can also do it on the user side. So you can just imagine that if we had an item graph, we can somehow uh, derive the item representations from the graph and the collaborative featuring data as well. Uh, maybe uh, one of the earliest methods uh, which uh, falls into this family is the model called uh, social recommendation. And so SOREC, uh, social recommendation using probabilistic matrix factorization, consists of a model of the user preferences and a similar model, but of the social network the signal for the social network here represented by C. So the goal is to factorize both sorts of information by sharing the user factor uh, between these two uh, factorization methods. So here you have the different assumptions for the latent factors. Uh, it's not so important. Uh, the um, key thing to keep in mind here is that your objective now consists of two factorizations problem sharing one factor, which is the user factor over here. So you can immediately see from this graphical representation that indeed our user representation will be affected both by her social connections as well as the item she interacted with. And then, yeah, we can optimize it uh, in the same way as the original uh, PMF model uh, by using uh, stochastic gradient descent. I know uh, another more recent example, which also falls into this family, is called GraphRec. Uh, it's quite a popular paper uh, published in the uh, same conference in uh, 2019. So the difference here with uh, the model we just showed, uh, SOREC, is that 
Now, the authors propose to use GNNs to represent users from their social interactions and user item interactions. Do you see we have the family of the method is still the same. We have just changed the base model we used to learn from user item interactions and uh, users, user user social connections. And here we have a little bit of details on how this operation are done. Actually, um, GraphRack, in addition to having embeddings for items, it also have embeddings for ratings. And then you somehow are given a user with her interactions here, for example, item three, um, six, and four. You just use this first type of observation to represent your data, to represent your user. Then similarly, you can use the social network of this user to derive another representation, which is called the social representation. And finally, you combine both of them to obtain the final uh, user representation. So again, we are still in that logic of using two sources of data to represent the user. Here we have some results uh, that basically show the importance of using both signals. So the yellow one is no social information, only ratings. The red one is no preferences, meaning using only the social network. And the blue one is the graphic model using both types of uh, information. So yeah, obviously here it seems to help. The performance is measured on uh, using RMSE may not be the best uh, measure for uh, recommender systems, but still. And then now the second family, uh, regularization-based one. Uh, here, it's a family of methods where the objective, as I mentioned earlier, is to use the graph somehow to regularize your uh, collaborative featuring model. Now, often, uh, this regularization is done in such a way as connected users or connected items are pulled closer in, in the latent space. So um, again, uh, one of the earliest work uh, falling into this family is uh, the model called SORAG. Uh, so here you have the traditional objective of uh, matrix factorization uh, that we have seen earlier. Then the author proposed two types of regularizations. The first one is to make the representation of the user I here close to the average representation of all his friends in the network. And now, the second type of regularization is simply to try to push or to pull closer our user's representation I and the representation of each of his friends. And then uh, finally, uh, the graph aware architecture, where this time the architecture of the collaborative filtering model itself is actually affected by the graph. We can see some examples here. Uh, so let's take the social RBM deep, for example. Um, here we have um, the vanilla RBM model for uh, user preferences. Um, if you are not so familiar with RBM, just uh, try to think of it as an autoencoder, right? Where the goal is to go from the adoptions X here to the hidden space, and then from the hidden space, come back to the adoption. So it is some sort of autoencoders uh, in a way. So what this model does, it adds another layer uh, on top of uh, the first hidden layer. And this second hidden layer will have actually as many neurons as the users in your social network. And the idea is that given a user, you will activate only the neurons corresponding to his friends in um, this architecture. So if we take, for example, a user one, who is connected to user four and user three. So in the last layer, last hidden layer, H2 here, we will activate the neurons corresponding to the user itself and to his friends while actually shutting down the other neurons. So you see the architecture of our model changes depending on the friends of each user. Uh, another uh, popular model in this context, which also somehow alters the architecture based 
on uh, the user uh, social connections is called uh, social Poisson factorization. Again here, let's just have a look at the um, a graphical model here. The observations here are clicks, uh, RUI, and then for every user to explain her preferences, we would use the traditional item factor, user factor, scalar product. But in addition to that, we add another component, which this time actually takes into account the friends of this user. And then, so all this thing uh, looks like this. It's a conditionally specified model, which means like to explain how user U likes item I, I will take into account not only the scale product between her Leiden factor and that of the corresponding item, but also uh, the ratings of her friends for these particular items represented by R V I here. So V are friends of user U. All right, um, as it may look like a hard to fit in practice, but you, you can have pretty scalable inference with uh, uh, some variational inference, yeah. So it's still uh, a model that you can scale. Uh, I just want to show some results here uh, related to uh, social Poisson factorization, which were taken from the main paper as well. That obviously here you see SPF is outperforming uh, in terms of this uh, NCRR measure here, which is basically NDCG without the log. Uh, so the reason the author choose to use this metric is because they argue that the log can listen, that uh, can lessen the effect of uh, the differences. So they just remove the log to make differences more visible. Uh, one important thing to see here is that if you analyze the results more closely, you will realize that some of the models here, even though they are using um, Social network information, like let's say Trust MF, which is using social network information, they are performing less good than the Poisson factorization, which doesn't even use any social network information. So the thing I wanted to highlight here, it's important to integrate additional data, but the base model you use to represent your collaborative filtering data is also very important. Right, so for, you should first identify which is the base model for collaborative filtering data which performs the best before trying to uh, add uh, a new source of information. And then if we want to give an example from the item side as well, uh, there is this model called uh, collaborative, uh, uh, collaborative context Poisson factorization, which this time actually includes uh, information from the item side, uh, which we call in this work item context, which can basically be represented by connections between items. So you can think of the context of the item as items that are often browsed together with a given item, et cetera. Again here, if you see the architecture, there is only one observation. The one observation uh, is the ratings represented here. But actually, in addition to that, we change the architecture of the whole matrix factorization to implicitly uh, integrate the context of items, uh, which can be represented as a sort of graph here. Um, and yeah, the performance are quite strong, uh, as you can see here on some Amazon data in terms of recall at 20. Uh, there is really a jump in performance when you take into account um, the uh, connections of the item uh, in the way we propose here, um, especially or mainly because knowing how items are related to one another allows you to quickly generalize user preferences to other similar items. And then more recently with um, the success of uh, graph models and graph attention networks, you have also other people that proposed to view the whole data meaning the user and item interactions, which can be seen as a bipartite graph, as well as any connections between item with other entities to see it as a whole, uh, as one graph, and then simply run graph methods like graph attention network on this um, uh, augmented graph, right? So initially we have user item interaction, bipartite, this is the collaborative signal, but we can also have connections between item and entities, and this whole thing, we can run on it uh, one uh, graph model. 
And then finally, we end up with both user and item representation, which we can combine to explain how they interact to, uh, with, uh, with each other. All right, so now more importantly, which family to use? So we have seen three main families of methods. So most of the methods you find in the literature in terms of modeling, they will fall into uh, these three families. And as I mentioned in the beginning, you may also have more like data-centric developments in which some people, they try actually to contribute not at the modeling level, but more at the data level. Like instead of having simple networks, how about having like hypergraphs, for example? Uh, those are also another um, way to see uh, or to propose improvements for uh, graph-based or uh, multimodal uh, graph-based collaborative filtering methods. And for today, we will restrict ourselves to uh, the model-centric approach. And yeah, so which family to use? Um, I would say it's context dependent. So suppose that you are working for a company, you already have deployed the recommender system in practice, and then suddenly you have some graph data that comes in and you would like to make use of this graph data. So, but you have some constraint from the business side or from the production side that you cannot increase the cost of inference, for example. It has to remain efficient and the same as the previous model. So then you may think of using the regularization-based approach because in the regularization-based approach, you on, it only affects the training of your model, which often can be done offline. But at inference time, you don't need that regularization term anymore. So in this particular case, you may think of going with this uh, family of approaches. Now consider another use case where you perform both recommendations in your platform and suddenly you have user social network, but now you want to perform recommendations not only at the item level, but also at the user level, like proposing, suggesting friends and things like that, then you may consider uh, modeling both informations in a joint way and take an approach like the uh, SOREC or social PMF model that can allow you to make recommendations simultaneously on the social network and uh, the user item space. Now, how about the architecture-based one? Now, it turns out like in practice, often when you design a whole architecture to your specific problem tends to perform better than methods from the other two families. Uh, but in a practice context, some people may also argue that doing so makes your model uh, quite specific, which means if you want to extend it uh, in the future, maybe to integrate other types of modalities like text on image, it may be less flexible than if you pick up uh, to go with uh, one method from uh, the earlier families, either regularization based or uh, feature based. Well, uh, here you have uh, a list of some uh, graph-based models supported in CORNAC, and also made uh, another list here of other and more recent existing uh, method in, in this context, uh, in case you want to explore uh, the topic uh, more. So in this section, we will talk, uh, discuss some uh, recent advance on recommendation explanation using multi-model data and learning how to manipulate them. Explanation may come from different data sources, uh, such as text, image, graph, and uh, so on. And uh, it may appear in many different forms. Explana uh, explanation can be uh, produced along with the recommendation via uh, an explainable recommendation model. Uh, it can be produced a post hoc via another explanation model. So in this uh, tutorial, we will discuss some recent recommendation model with explainability relying on additional modality, including text modalities, uh, image modalities and graph modalities. Yeah, here are the, the list of uh, some references that uh, we use in this section. Now, now uh, let's turn our attention to explanation that appear in uh, textual forms. This is a uh, review level explanation. As some uh, 
some reviews are more useful than others, as you can see in this example. So in, in 2018, Gen et al. proposed a recommendation model with neural network at the architecture that optimized for rating prediction, which on, uh, also uh, uh, help to identify useful review based on attention mechanism. And uh, the, uh, this is the overall, the, the overall architecture of the, their model. So the main idea is to weigh the contribution of uh, user and item reviews toward the final recommendation objective via an attention mechanism uh, you see on the left and the right hand side on the user net and item net. Right? Now in the end, the, the um, useful review will be identified by the attention weight on the item, item net on the right hand side here. And uh, this is another model uh, uh, which name HRDR uh, is also uh, can uh, produce the uh, review level explanation. And the idea is uh, roughly similar to uh, narrate uh, the previous uh, introduction introduce model, but uh, the main difference uh, here is that instead of using user or item embedding directly, it's, uh, it use the rating representation of the user or uh, use item uh, rating representation of the item, uh, which is the ratings of all the user have rate on that use uh, item or to uh, uh, infuse that information to construct the attention uh, weight to se uh, select the useful review. So uh, in the end, uh, we will select, uh, we will be able to select the useful review or the most uh, important review identified by this model to be to present for the end user as uh, explanation. So in the addition to review, right, we observe that question and answer also present a factual concern that could be present to the end user as a complementary information for explanation alongside with the review level explanation I ha has discussed previously. So uh, we propose a model named Quester, uh, Question Attentive uh, Review Level Explanation Model, which uh, leverage additional question and answer data to enhance the review level explanation, as well as present a novel question level explanation. Specifically on uh, the item side, side, we have additional question and answer on um, QA data. Here we uh, presume that product reviews may contain information that could be relevant to question. So we first aggregate another attention layer based on item question that um, help us uh, incorporate review based on their contribution toward the item uh, question. And then we aggregate those representation to what the item text representation using uh, another attention layer, uh, which ultimately contribute to the final item representation. So in the end, right, we can select a pair of question and answer as well as a, a review for item uh, recommendation explanation. So um, next here, I will um, uh, talk about another simpler form of explanation that appear uh, in a template. So th this work uh, is explicit factor model for explainable recommendation based on phrase level sentiment analysis. And uh, this work, they assume that user may focus on various aspects. Uh, different user may focus on different aspects. Uh, for recommendation uh, of a recommendation product. So when we re recommend uh, products, uh, uh, this model uh, will also highlight the quality of the aspect for a certain user. So in this case, we would like to know which aspect a user in is interested in and which aspect a product performs well or poorly in. 
So before we uh, go into the detail of the model, I would like to mention about the input aspect and sentiment. And where they come from? Actually, we, we can extract the information from the text store review, which are uh, user generated uh, uh, text content on, uh, yeah, it's a uh, peer very popular on the e-commerce site. And um, this, this is the procedure uh, for extracting those aspects and sentiments. Uh, first, we need a set of aspect words and a set of opinion words. Then we uh, would like to identify the sentiment of an uh, aspect uh, in a given review. So one um, possible uh, solution is that we can assign plus one for positive opinion and uh, minus one for negative opinion. Uh, and in some cases, right, where it's, uh, the opinion uh, may associate with the neg negation uh, and uh, the sentiment should be reversed by the negation. For example, in this case, a not good should be uh, um, have the sentiment of minus one instead of plus one for the, the same opinion good, right? And this is an example on how aspect and sentiment are extracted from a review. So here we have two sentence uh, and uh, each sentence discuss uh, different uh, uh, aspect. The first as aspect is screen and uh, the second aspect is the earphone. In uh, the second sentence, right, the opinion uh, uh, is reverse because we have the negation. So in the end, we got the sentiment of the screen is plus one and the earphone is minus one. After having aspect and sentiment, uh, the EFM models, uh, how much a user care about every aspect by a matrix called uh, user aspect attention matrix. And uh, they, uh, Construct this matrix by the given uh, formula uh, in the slide. Uh, if the user never mentioned about an aspect, the score is zero. And if uh, an aspect is mentioned by the user in their reviews, uh, they um, use the the number of uh, times that aspect has been mentioned. It means the more uh, the number of times it has been mentioned, the higher the value is. And uh, uh, in this formula, uh, they would like to project the um, attention score, which means how much the user care about the, that certain aspect uh, to the same scale as the rating uh, uh, score like 1 to 5. So uh, similarly, in uh, the, the item, uh, we also uh, see that EBM model, how good an aspect for a given item by another matrix named item aspect quality matrix. Uh, it is constructed by uh, the given formula. And uh, this is uh, quite uh, yeah, similar to the previous formula, but one main difference is that the instead of using the frequency or the number of, of time the aspect has been mentioned, this one is will uh, aggregate or sum up on the sentiment of a given aspect to uh, construct the as, uh, aspect quality score for the item aspect quality matrix. So, uh, which means the higher the total sentiment, it means the, the more positive the sentiment, uh, the closer the, the aspect quality score uh, approach to the max value, which is, uh, for example, five, uh, similar to five star when we uh, do rating. Uh, if uh, the more negative the sentiment, it will approach to the value one. So the main idea of this uh, uh, FM model is that they will do the factorization, uh, the matrix um, user aspect attention matrix X and item aspect quality matrix Y alongside with the rating matrix R. Um, so the core idea is that uh, these uh, parameters will be um, decomposed uh, along to uh, all together uh, because they, they have some share 
uh, uh, component, right? It will it will enforce the collaboratory uh, collaborative filtering effects across uh, various components. So if M we will produce uh, explanation by uh, select amongst the most care aspect and uh, it uh, can only uh, select uh, uh, the aspect then uh, show put in the template and uh, the template on, can only show uh, well or poorly uh, uh, explanation for a certain aspect. For the ranking score, they also um, propose a, like a trade-off between the rating prediction and the, the score given by the user um, aspect uh, attention matrix and item aspect quality uh, matrix uh, uh, to be the ranking score. So next I will uh, discuss some um, uh, like extension or enhancement uh, uh, upon the the EFM model or uh, upon the, the template uh, or evaluative uh, explanation. So first I would like to show here uh, we uh, we observed that previous uh, works focus on evaluate evaluative explanation, which means they will explain a certain product on its own, which are not uh, compared to any other products. So um, in this work, we pre prefer to uh, compare one product to another uh, product, which is uh, another reference product is uh, um, in uh, the history, uh, uh, it's been the user purchased before. So um, we say that a product dominate by another product if the former product uh, is at least as good as the later products and uh, a uh, better in at least one one aspect. Uh, we observe that most of the time the later purchases are not dominated by the previously bought products. So we propose a, a model named a comparer or comparative explainable recommendation. Um, the main idea is to uh, maintain the comparison order of the explanation while optimizing for the recommendation. In other words, we uh, would like to reconstruct um, the the predict or uh, the, the score of the quality metric in short the way that it should reflect the relative comparison between the product we bought earlier and product we bought like later uh, the one uh, we uh, recommendation uh, do the recommendation with uh, the recommend the reference product so um it, the core idea of this uh, work uh, rely on the aspect level quality so um in this uh, slide, I show that uh, we may have two different mo mode of uh, aspect level quality. The first mode is uh, subjective, which means aspect level quality can be different for different users. For example, one user may prefer one design color uh, of a phone, while another user doesn't like it at all. In contrast, um, we have the objective aspect level quality. Uh, would refer to the aspect level quality that's independent from user. For example, from uh, some aspects such as uh, battery life, right? Uh, we uh, we all always know that people prefer the phone with longer battery life. So in this uh, presentation, I will um, discuss more about the objective aspect uh, level quality. For the subject mode, please uh, refer to our paper for more detail. So this mode, uh, this mode of um, aspect level quality could be represented by a quality metric of uh, products and uh, aspect. Uh, so each quality score could be constructed by aspect level 
uh, sentiment extracted from the uh, from the, the product review as we discussed before in the event model, right? And uh, the formula of uh, constructing the score is similar as before. We have the the sentiment, uh, uh, the total sentiment score here. And um, so what we would like to do is what we would like to uh, preserve the instance. Uh, it means we preserve the quality score of the uh, later purchase product, uh, uh, which are better than the previously purchased product. And uh, we uh, maintain that relative order to uh, to make the model uh, can produce the comparative uh, explanation. Uh, this is the constraint. So uh, we also apply another scaling factor uh, which is uh, highlighted in the, the red color here is one plus log number of um, CJJ gram uh, uh, be because uh, uh, not all uh, constraint uh, uh, support by uh, uh, the, by the quality metrics is support by one one user uh, uh, some of them may be supported by many more purchases sequenced by different user right. And we just count the number of uh, time is supported by different uh, purchase sequence, and we put in this uh, scaling factor to to um, to tell the model um, uh, way uh, it uh, higher or uh, enforce the constraint stronger than than uh, the one with only one one um, uh, one time. So in the end, uh, the, explain, the explanation uh, uh, we put in this uh, template, uh, which uh, highlight the, the aspect that the current recommendation item is better, better than the, the reference item. And also we show another uh, aspect that the previous item better than the current item uh, to, for the user to see the difference of uh, this is the comparison. So next, um, next um, to enhance the form of explanation upon the templates, right, uh, by the explanation, we, um, we uh, propose uh, another uh, framework named synthesizing explanation for explainable recommendation, which a uh, um, a, more, a framework that uh, selects sentences from uh, other user reviews to form the explanation for the, the recommendation. So um, the inputs uh, of these uh, frameworks are review sentences. So, uh, and uh, for example, in uh, the following sentences are come from uh, a product mouse, so a great mouse, this is a good mouse, the size is good, uh, very good mouse, etc. Uh, we assume that there is an aspect demand for a given user to know about the recommendation products. For example, here we we um, have a tool, uh, the user may, uh, may um, have a, a demand up two sentence about mouse, one sentence about scroll, and one sentence about size. And finally, uh, is the, the aspect level sentiment scores uh, or, or aspects level uh, sentiment preference of the user from uh, this this one could be learned from another compatible explainable recommendation uh, such as uh, uh, if a model or comparer for example uh, this uh, this framework will select sentences to satisfy the given uh, demand and uh, uh, we can, can see here we we will select two sentences about mouse, one sentence about score, and one sentence about size. And uh, the the original opinion of the sentence may not fit the target user uh, preference. So uh, we also propose to uh, substitute the opinion if in if in the case the uh, the uh, user preference is. Uh, not fit with the selected sentence uh, based on the sentence 
pulled from the other user reviews. So um, uh, uh, when substituting uh, opinion, uh, this may express the same sentiment uh, as before or uh, the uh, swap the sentiment depending on the target user preference. It means when we have different uh, uh, other different aspects sentiment score uh, from this different user from the uh, of the same sentence, it may uh, have different opinion works as well. So uh, to do this, we would like to select sentences. Those are most representative to others. Um, so we use a cost function that measure how representative a sentence to another sentence. So this cost uh, could be constructed in several ways, uh, such that um, uh, using cosine similarity of the sentence TF idea vectors, or we can train uh, a supervised learning model to provide the, the cost. So in the, any cases, uh, we consider this to be given. Uh, consider for the below example, right? If we were to just select a sentence among the four candidates and uh, the constructed cost uh, shown in the, the table, uh, we uh, would select the sentence S2 as it uh, produced the, the lowest cost. Uh, and um, we also uh, prefer to select the sentence uh, from uh, fewer reviewers, you know, which uh, uh, as it uh, could be more coherent because it's come from the same user, right? Uh, to model this, we uh, associate another cost uh, to uh, reviews that we select a sentence from. In all, uh, we would like to optimize the overall cost uh, that combines the representative and the uh, coherent cost. Uh, these two uh, components have an inherent trade-off, as you can see. At, uh, when we, uh, for example, when we add a new sentence, uh, it may lower the representative cost. But uh, if the new sentence is more sim similar to the previous sentences we have selected, um, uh, we ha have selected, but uh, it's, uh, it also risks uh, increasing the, the coherent cost because uh, the sentence may come from uh, another user uh, that uh, not uh, have the, the sentence have, uh, already inside the solution uh, set. And um, this is the overall architecture of uh, the shear framework. If you are interested, uh, I suggest you to look through the, the paper. So we we have discussed about uh, uh, text. Uh, so now let's uh, turn our attention to visual explainable uh, recommendation. Uh, specifically, this, this work uh, try to highlight um, the region on the image that uh, match the content uh, in the review text. So uh, the basic idea is that uh, sometimes we, we use the, the uh, convolution neural network, right? We, we can build uh, the uh, different type of attention uh, uh, here to, uh, to be able to highlight different region on that, that, that image. But um, to enforce that one alongside with the review text, uh, to, to see whether it, it's that uh, region, uh, that highlight region uh, is matched with uh, certain uh, uh, snippet of, of uh, text or not. And we can produce that one as uh, the explanation for the recommendation. Uh, this is some example uh, for, for, as you see on the, uh, the target item, right? And the uh, text review and the, uh, ECF is the uh, model, and it's highlighted like in the first uh, row, it's highlighted the toe, right? And inside the text to review, also highlight the toe. Yeah, we can see more example um, later. Okay. So another um, method here, uh, which is uh, uh, multi-model review generation. In this model, uh, it's um, used to like, um, uh, like uh, more than one multi 
uh, more than one modality is which is text modality and uh, uh, image modalities uh, and um, from uh, text both text and uh, image it can um, uh, uh, along with the predictive rating uh, the authors of the of this work to try to to generate the, the text from those in, information like we we may change the image we, uh, as input and we may receive a different uh, sentence and that sentence uh, may um, uh, uh, tell us why we should uh, or shouldn't um, uh, adopt the uh, recommendation item And uh, this uh, model, they have uh, a few components like the rating prediction is similar to uh, new, uh, neural convolutional, uh, uh, neural, uh, the, the neural magic uh, factorization. And, and uh, the next part is the review uh, text generation. And this one will uh, take the user representation item representation as, uh, as well as the rating uh, predicted rating score and the, the visual uh, feature uh, extracted from the image as well as the input to uh, be able to produce the uh, review or the, the generation text here and uh, here are some example like on the uh, the both um the bow uh bow um review is the generated uh text one and the the one below is the ground truth right and uh, as we can see in the input photo on the left uh, the the text on the right is uh, is uh, is very good in in um uh explaining the the we have yeah and here show uh, another uh, example and it's sure it's instead of a uh, focus on the the aspect well it, it's highlight a uh, different uh, like opinion as well uh, and uh, uh, that is just some um, some uh, uh, works on the visual uh, explanation. We uh, uh, now we 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 uh, we let let take uh, another look on the uh, uh, graph uh, modalities. And uh, this work has been introduced by Agnes uh, in pre previous uh, slides. And I will not re repeat it. Uh, uh, and I will focus more on the explanation part. So after we. Uh, we construct the knowledge graph, right? Like different user may link to different entity, and we we may base on the, this uh, type of graph to to uh, to explain the uh, the record, the reason why the the a certain item um being recommended uh, for that user. So in this uh. Uh, explain it. Uh, this example, right? We, you can see the user uh, two zero eight uh, is uh, recommended uh, uh, the item I uh, four to uh, nine three here. Uh, we can try back uh, based on the 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 attention uh, the the weight here. As we, you can see, it will link to like the entity named uh, John Skaji, right? Then. Uh, uh, is uh, the relation is the author of the the uh, another movies like old man, uh, old man war right uh, and uh, that one will be the explanation like the this user uh, is recommend uh, that this item because the, he's uh, watched another uh, movies or books uh, uh, of this author. So on the right hand side, we use uh, we see a similar uh, example. But uh, in this case, we uh, explain by another link to another user instead of uh, another uh, uh, entity. 
like the user 208 is the uh, recommended because it's uh, it's um have the a uh, friends like you user 3793 right what watch uh that that movie uh watch the 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 last colony movie and that's uh linked to the the old man world uh, based on the knowledge graph and uh, uh yeah to be honest uh, there are a lot uh more uh works on different uh kind of uh, explaining recommendation explanation and it's based on the different type of data and uh, reason uh works based on both uh, image and um, text and so uh, a lot of work uh, are based on graph uh, moralities and in this uh, uh tutorial i just uh merely introduce you about the, the sum of those work and uh, in the hand on section you we will uh, focus more on the, uh, the text to uh, data for you later so I think that that is all for my part. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you, Juan. Yeah, so uh, there is, let me see, let me take back the control first. Um, now there's gonna be another hands-on on explainability, but I think as we mentioned earlier, we're probably gonna do that at the very end. So instead, I think there's gonna be a little bit of discussions uh, in terms of the future directions. And I think I will let uh, Aglis talk a little bit more about this. Thanks, uh, Juan, for the great and comprehensive uh, uh, presentation on uh, explainability uh, in the context of recommendation. So just a few words about possible direction for explainability is, um, uh, I mean, to look at into generative models. Uh, we are hearing a lot about uh, uh, chat GPT and its capabilities as a conversational agent. It turns out that it can do well at recommendations, um, but more importantly, at also explaining the recommendations. So in the example here, we actually ask uh, chat GPT using the uh, Rakuten Viber AI uh, chat interface um, to explain a list of recommendations for a given user. Uh, so the user, we assume that the, this user um, likes Steve Jobs' biography book, and we tell the system that actually this user has received the following uh, recommendations. Can you explain them in, in a concise way? Um, and it seems like if you look at to the answer on the right, um, it kind of was able to understand what these books are about, even though we have provided only the titles. Uh, now, again, th those are cultural products. Uh, I have personally tested it on cultural products, but it will be interesting to see how it can perform as well on other types of items. Um, and, and also, like you see here, with a very limited context, it's able to say, like, the recommendation list includes books that are closely related to the topic of technology, business, and leadership. So those are all aspects related to Steve Jobs. Uh, what we can infer from here is that it actually has the knowledge uh, to understand that indeed uh, Steve Jobs is a tech person and a leader as well. And also that the recommendation books seem to make sense because uh, they are related to these aspects. So there's some knowledge there that can be unlocked to explain uh, recommendations in a more general sense and in a textual way. And here uh, we took the same user, but this time with a different set of recommendations. Um, and we picked a set of recommendations which are not very related and which may seem like uh, not so good recommendations for a user interested in reading uh, Steve Jobs books. Uh, and again, it is, it's subjective, of course, but it, it's interesting how it it's also able to say like, okay, maybe uh, this time this set of recommendations are not directly interested um, to uh, Steve Jobs, uh, but, and then they may be accurate for someone interested in reading the um, uh, Steve Jobs uh, biography book, but it, it kind of says, 
it may be interested for some other reasons. Uh, what is important to keep in mind here is that maybe there is uh, a huge potential in looking at this kind of systems, uh, not only as conversational agents, but also at explaining uh, sets of recommendations or even like evaluating the quality uh, of the sets of recommendations, because it's just that there is a lot of knowledge encoded in the system as a sort of database. So by taking the context about the recommended items here, obviously only the title, but imagine you can also specify features about every item. Can you like fit this to the model and ask it if it makes sense uh, given the previous user interest? Yeah, that was uh, all uh, for this part. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free uh, to ask them.